Hello, I'm Kelly McFarland, and this is Diplomatic Community from the Institute for the Study of Diplomacy. My friends, I want to talk to you today very simply about government. We need to use diplomacy and build international consensus to resolve our problems whenever possible. Our diplomats are working with a range of partners to strengthen human rights protections. This is not a time to undercut our diplomats. And today, in our boasted modern civilization, we are facing just exactly the same problem, just exactly the same conflict. Well, folks, here we are. It's the end of our fifth season, the one in which we explored the world of multilateral diplomacy. From the UN to regional institutions to issue-based organizations, we here at IST this season really wanted to move beyond issues of bilateral diplomacy and look at the ever-emerging world of multilateral diplomacy, uh, especially because we believe it's going to be so important moving forward. For today's episode, we're going to look back over the season with two of our resident experts here at IST, Ambassador Jeffrey De Laurentiis and Tressa Finnerty both of whom have years of experience working on multilateral institutions at the U.S. Department of State. Ambassador retired Jeffrey De Laurentiis is currently acting deputy representative of the United States to the United Nations. During his 28-year career in the Foreign Service, he worked almost exclusively on Western Hemisphere issues and served as a multilateral diplomat at the United Nations. He served as the first charged affairs at the U.S. Embassy in Havana, following the reestablishment of diplomatic relations between the United States and Cuba. Prior to taking up his Cuba post in August 2014, he was ambassador, alternate representative for special political affairs at the U.S. mission to the United Nations. Previously, he served as deputy assistant secretary of state for the Bureau of Western Hemisphere Affairs and as minister counselor for political affairs and security council coordinator at the U.S. mission to the U.N. He's a graduate of the Georgetown University School of Foreign Service, and Columbia University Graduate School of International and Public Affairs. Tressa Ray Finnerty is a career member of the Senior Foreign Service with more than 20 years of experience at the Department of State, most recently serving as Deputy Executive Secretary. A specialist in multilateral diplomatic engagement and negotiation, Tressa led teams at U.S. missions to the United Nations in New York and Geneva. An expert in humanitarian and refugee policy, she taught courses on international refugee practices at NYU, led emergency humanitarian operations to welcome freed political prisoners from Nicaragua in 2023, and created the Dulles Afghan Refugee Transit Center, which rapidly brought nearly 50,000 Afghans to safety in 2021. She built the first ever in-country refugee processing center for Iraqis fleeing the war there in 2008-2009. Tressa has also served at U.S. embassies in Malaysia, Iraq, Armenia, and Thailand, in Washington in the Office for North Korea Policy, and as a board member of Executive Women at State, which supports women for senior leadership positions. Prior to joining the Foreign Service, Tressa was a business strategy and change management consultant. She holds a BA and MBA from the George Washington University and is a member of the board of directors of Up With The People, an international youth leadership organization. As a disclaimer that our listeners know very well, the opinions expressed in this conversation are strictly those of Jeff and Tressa, and do not necessarily represent the views of the U.S. Department of State or the U.S. government. Let's listen to the conversation. Welcome, everybody, to the season finale of season five of Diplomatic Immunity. I'm uh, pleased to be joined today by Jeff De Laurentiis and... Tressa Finnerty to talk about, uh, to wrap up our season on multilateralism and uh, international organizations and regional organizations. So uh, welcome, guys. Glad to be here. It's a pleasure. So Jeff, I'm going to start with you and Mm -hmm. and Tressa, feel free to to jump in whenever. But one of the things we've talked a lot about this this season and something that's not, you know, that's not necessarily new um, when you talk about international organizations and multilateralism is sort of the the death of the UN or international affairs from international bodies and things like that. But we'd like to know from your perspective, you've both dealt with the UN and international organizations and multilateralism a lot in your careers. How do you view it from where you sit? And Jeff, especially being at the UN now, how do you view sort of the, the future of the, the present and the future of 
multilateralism and international organizations? It's a good question. Um, I think we have to make a distinction between multilateral diplomacy uh, and the UN or some other multilateral or regional uh, institution. Because in some quarters, we see uh, some successes. Uh, uh, we just had a, a big water conference at the UN that everyone deemed to be a success. We've just had a, a high seas treaty uh, um, successfully uh, concluded. Uh, and those, are, those I think, are, 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 are pretty big deals. Um, when you bring it to matters of international peace and security and the Security Council, uh, I think that's uh, where you begin to hear the murmurs about um, uh, less success or, or a mixed, uh, uh, mixed success. And that's because uh, uh, today, in particular, we have a permanent member, a permanent member who was supposed to have a special responsibility to adhere to the UN Charter, has blatantly uh, violated it and had violated the principles of territorial integrity and sovereignty. And so um, it, 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 it's not surprising to me that people are, are beginning to question uh, uh, the utility. But the fact of the matter is that if the UN didn't exist, somebody would have to uh, invent it. And, and the UN is a lot more than the Security Council. And frankly, even in the Security Council, we're getting a lot done. Um, but on this very basic um, issue, uh, there's certainly cause for concern. Mm -hmm. I think I would just add to that about um, a focus on our expectations. I think it was in 1954, Dag Hammarskjöld, the UN Secretary General, said that the UN was not created in order to bring us to heaven, but in order to save us from hell. And so what are our expectations for the UN and multilateralism writ large? And if we right-size our expectations... And also look at the reality. When the United Nations in particular was created, it had 51 founding members. That was 1945. Today, 193 members. That's great, but it's infinitely more complicated. And so it will be slower and it will be more challenging. But it is, as Jeff said, um, the organization that we have. And if we didn't have it, we would need something to take that place where all nations can get together and try to find solutions, prosperity, and reality to move forward together. I was just going to add that, that um, I, I think that's exactly right. And, and the UN often gets uh, a bad rap um, mm -hmm. because it's, it's the 193 countries that are running the place um, that actually have the responsibility to use the institutions of the UN to, to bring us to a you know, successful a conclusion, whether it's a whether it's a peace treaty, whether it's a peacekeeping operation, um, whether it's a water conference or high seas treaty, whatever um, the topic is uh, of the day, it's it, it's up to the member states um, to drive it forward. Yeah, and it's it's interesting too because in our interview with Stefan Dejarik, he he specifically mentioned the the food deal between Ukraine and Russia and how you know that could only go so far until the UN stepped in to, to, to kind of oversee that and guarantee that um, that deal and stuff. So I think there's, even when you do have these issues in the Security Council, it is still getting things done um, in a place like Ukraine. Um, but another thing we, we talked about throughout the season is we looked at different multilateral bodies, whether it be the, the big one, the UN, but then also some regional bodies. And one, one thing that we've talked a lot about uh, throughout the season is this term and not or. And by that, I mean that it's people are more and more looking to it's not the UN or the, the OAS or the AU. It's more so how can these bodies work together? How can the international community uh, sort of partner with regional bodies as we start to see regional organizations take on more roles in certain things? So how have you seen that play out at the UN or in sort of your, your longer career in multilateralism? What is the importance of these regional bodies and especially as they try to work with the, the UN moving forward? I, I think the regional bodies um, can be very important. Uh, they're, they have different characteristics, I would say, in each, in each region, different strengths, different um, weaknesses. But I think we're seeing more and more sort of synergy, complementarity between uh, uh, the UN, particularly in matters of international peace and security. Uh, and and regional bodies. Uh, in the case of um, 
uh, Myanmar, Burma, for uh, example, ASEAN has, has taken a, a leading role with its five point plan. The, the Security Council, uh, not too long ago in December, I think, during the um, Indian uh, presidency, just before they rotated off, um, was able to uh, a, 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 a adopt a product um, with, with respect to Burma. And I think part of that was. Uh, based upon and endorsing the work um, that ASEAN has been uh, doing. Certainly in Africa, uh, uh, with the AU, they're taking uh, a much more active role. And so there's uh, uh, greater uh, cooperation, greater uh, synergy, uh, I think. Uh, and and I, I'm quite sure that will only uh, increase. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I mean, all politics really are local. And so regional groups give you a one stop shop for at least some shared interests that are on a regional basis. Um, and I think that it's an important space also when you're working in New York or in Geneva in particular at the United Nations to be able to link in to those regional groups where a diplomat may not have time to talk to every ASEAN member, every AU member, every OAS member, but can they talk to the leadership or a committee of those organizations as they consider um, their policies and, and get a regional perspective? So I think it's also a realistic time saver that means that we're more likely to have input from regions than not. You hinted at uh, this notion that, you know, at times like these with the war going on that that one of the security members is taking part in, that the UN tends to get a, a more negative rap than normal because they sort of can't do anything really to fix the war that's going on or can't really bring it to the Security Council um, in, a, in a productive way because of Russia's role in the war. But looking back at you know, throughout your careers, um, not necessarily just right now, but through through the years that both of you have worked on these issues, uh, what are some of the successes? You mentioned some successes, but what are some of the successes that that the U.S. has had working through the U.N. or through multilateral bodies, regional bodies, um, some that folks might just not know about that sort of go under the radar but are really important things um, for the U.S., um, but also just the U.N. more more generally? So, so I think um, I should answer that in, in, in two ways. Um, first of all, when it comes to the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine, yes, the Security Council hasn't been able to act as we would um, have liked it to, but there have been many, many meetings of the Security Council about it, and certain um, uh, issues have, have been um, aired and, and profiles uh, raised with each uh, uh, with each meeting we've had, uh, the most recent being um, a meeting that the, the the Russians called on effective multilateralism. They called it, which was a signature event during their presidency last month in April. Um, and I, I I would say that that um, uh, uh, the foreign minister um, uh, of the Russian Federation was rather ske skewered. Um, uh, complaint, criticism after criticism after criticism after criticism uh, open, and I think that that um, uh, that's important. And also uh, uh, the various actions of the General Assembly. There have been several resolutions, overwhelming numbers: 140, 141, 143 uh, yes votes. Um, Russia has been suspended from the Human Rights Council. Uh, Russia has not been able to be reelected to the Economic and Social Council. Uh, all of these um, uh, initiatives, and I I I if you will, we're kind of building a case, um, mm -hmm. plus initiatives by OAS, other entities, um, other regional uh, organizations. Uh, so, so other aspects of the UN and other organizations, I think, has have been able to keep this issue alive and make some very important political. Uh, 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 points with respect to the actions of Russia over the last um, over the last uh, year. Um, a, a, apart from that, um, in the middle of all this, let's say there are probably a couple of things that initially come to mind in terms of of successes. One is um, it's it's resolution two six six four, which was passed in October or November of last year 
which created a humanitarian carve out for all of the UN uh, um, sanctions regimes. Pretty, mm-hmm. pretty consequential uh, action. We we partnered with Ireland. Um, I was very happy to see President Biden even mention it in his speech in Dublin. Uh, uh, very important for the Irish, very important for us. Uh, there were a couple of other countries that wanted in on this, this process, but we thought it was best to uh, leave it to the two countries. And to get that through the Security Council was significant. Maybe the other thing I would mention also last fall was a new sanctions regime on Haiti. Uh, first uh, uh, sanctions regime since, I think, 2017. Um, I think it, it will be an effective deterrent, not the only action necessary, but an effective deterrent uh, against gang leaders uh, in Haiti. And given the criticism that sanctions um, uh, uh, receive in general, uh, it was quite significant that that was also able to pass through, uh, even by those who are uh, always criticizing the United States for using the tool of sanctions uh, in such an effective way. I think in addition to those examples, I like to zoom out a little further to the organizations within the UN family that we don't think about on a daily basis, or perhaps Jeff and I do, but most normal people don't. Um, The specialized agencies in particular that create norms. So for example, ITU helps us actually be able to have worldwide SMS messaging. I know I received a couple text messages this morning as a result of those norms. UPU, the Postal Union, allows folks to buy a package from amazon.com and it comes from another country and our postal service gets paid, their postal service gets paid and uh, commerce continues. ICAO provides civilian airline safety, WTO, trade dispute, et cetera. So I think the norms that specialized agencies um, provide that the average person listening to this podcast won't think about every day, but they touch every day. And then also humanitarian agencies within the UN system and the wider multilateral system, I think are really important. WFP for food, UNHCR for shelter and protection of refugees, UNICEF for child vaccinations in particular. Listen, I don't think we call these or label these a success because it's never enough. It's never sufficient. It's always in the midst of conflict and Mm -hmm. humanitarian disaster. But the reality is that many millions of people each day, each year, this is their lifeline. And without these agencies, we, we don't, I don't know what the answer would be for them. And so I think that we have to pay due respect to the uh, organization, the cleverness, the bravery of the, those who work for these organizations and the member states who support and fund them. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the, the norms and standards uh, issues that, that bodies like the UN take on. Um, my my class in the fall, we were just talking about teaching here at Georgetown, um, is a course on globalization and the history of globalization. And we we talked about, we read this book called The History of an Idea, um, which is about the history of international government going back to like 1815. And, and it's interesting that one of the major carryovers of the League of Nations was actually the creation of all these standards and norms that sort of was taken up by a bunch of former League officials that came to the United States and kept those kind of going. And then uh, it carried over into the UN. But so again, something that like most people don't think about that and like the importance of those things on a daily basis. Um, but uh, so I'm going to, we've got two final questions for the two of you, but I'm going to kind of combine them because they're, they, they kind of go together um, in a way. Um, but, you know, if you look at the world today, and we just had a working group that we run here at Georgetown uh, at ISD on um, the unintended consequences of the Ukraine war, and we've talked a lot in, the, in, that, in those meetings on multilateralism um, and the issues of multilateralism. If you look at like the Biden administration's national security um, strategy and look at sort of the geopolitical challenges, but then all the transnational challenges, it's apparent that multilateralism is going to be a major tool of diplomacy and something that we're just we can't get around it in the future. You need to deal with multiple countries. Now, there's still going to be bilateral relations, but on a lot of these issues, you have to bring together multiple countries to deal with these things. So at the same time, though, there was chatter at our working group meetings about how few, at least at this point in the 
um, senior foreign service of the U.S., how few people have actually served in multilateral organizations or multilateral postings, um, but how important they're going to be now and moving forward. So how do you, you know, how do you get more people to want to take those? How do you incentivize those sort of posts and that kind of thing? Um, so that leads me to my final question. What, what role do you see multilateralism playing in the future? Are you optimistic about it? Um, and then following on to that, and this gets to sort of more to my, my second comment there, what would your advice be to a, to a new FSO or, you know, Jeff, what advice are you giving your students that are taking your multilateralism course right now? The, the one line would be, uh, go for it. Uh, I, I think, well, I, I should say, um, when I entered the foreign service, um, many years ago, uh, uh, we were told very directly, um, Multilateral diplomacy, the Bureau of International Organizations, not career enhancing, yeah. right? Uh, you need to be in the regional bureaus where all, where the real the action, action yeah. is. Uh, and okay, maybe it's my contrarian spirit, but I was uh, very interested in the UN and I didn't pay any attention to the uh, advice. And it certainly didn't do uh, me any harm. But, but more important than that, I think there's been a very slow transition uh, multilateral multilateral diplomacy has been mainstreamed. Um, it was certainly mainstreamed uh, in terms of policy making during the Obama administration. It's certainly the case uh, uh, in the in the Biden administration, and I think it's it, it's inevitable because you you have these issues um, that that don't know borders, uh, don't care about national borders, and and need to be addressed. I mean, climate change, pandemic management, uh, migration. Um, economic development, other other things. So, I think the future uh, is there. That's not to say that that uh, uh, bi bilateral diplomacy is shrinking away, but but multilateral diplomacy, I think, I, I, I just I, I think is here to stay. And what what I try and do is with my students anyway, is is to encourage them to keep an open mind uh, to create um, you know, a simulation that, okay, you're walking into a room, you've got 14, if it's the Security Council, you've got 14 other uh, diplomats there, you have to figure out what are they thinking, what do they want, what can you achieve, what's the sweet spot. Um, it's, it's like three-dimensional chess. And, and for me, this is, uh, uh, th this is fun, it's challenging, uh, uh, it's, it's enjoyable, and when you actually uh, achieve something, uh, it, it, it feels pretty good, and, and you're also uh, making some progress on important uh, issues. So um, I think it's 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 the wave of the future. It's here to stay, and we need to make sure we now the State Department need to make sure that our officers are officers are trained um, and and familiar with this kind of uh, environment. Mm -hmm. Because it is like you met, I mean, it's a different beast. It's a different when you're beast. dealing with 14 yeah. different yeah. nations or groups instead of one. Right. Um, it's just, yeah, way of thinking about it and, and going about it are different. Trust yeah. I came to multilateralism by accident, which is really the story of my career. Um, I saw the UN and various agencies in the field in Thailand, working with refugees in Iraq during the war, um, looking to help the elections and also uh, refugees and humanitarian crises. And then I followed the best diplomat I had seen to New York, to our mission there. And then I got bitten by the bug because I had amazing mentors and bosses like Ambassador Jeff De Laurentiis and others, um, and learn to just love it. But, uh, you know, I'm not optimistic by nature. I'm very much a realist. I was once told that to be a diplomat, you have to be optimistic. And I thought, oh, dear, I'm in the wrong profession. But listen, wh why do we have to be optimistic about it, right? Multilateralism is a tool. Um, do we have to be optimistic about tools? No, we have to know how to use them smartly, cleverly, when to use them, when to um, not use them. And so I, I'm very realist about what multilateralism can provide and what its limitations are. Um, but I am very optimistic actually at the concept. Listen, there's no other organization that was either built or is created or on a day-to-day -day function tries to bring together every nation state and other members of civil society and media and others to talk about problems that are current and in need of solution. There's no other organization that does it. So how can you not 
actually fall in love with it a bit. Um, and what do I tell students or other maybe beginning diplomats? Uh, I, I suggest to them, don't do what I did, uh, which is become a great bilateral diplomat first and understand how your system, your own system works. Understand for us in Washington, how do you inject uh, suggestions for policy decisions that actually get picked up? How do you implement those policy decisions once they exist? Because if you understand your system, then the power that you can pull out of our multilateral system, and especially our U.S. missions to the U.N. in New York and Geneva, it's awesome. But if you don't know how to do that, then you just have a lot of energy and ideas flying around that you can't box up and package for your capital. So understand Washington. And then, like Jeff said, go for it. Yeah. And like you said, optimistic or not, it's it, it's inevitable. So, uh, you know, we're going to need multilateralism uh, to be a bigger and bigger tool moving forward. Um, do you guys have any final thoughts? I, I was thinking, going back to your earlier question about um, achievements of, uh, let's say, the Security Council that folks wouldn't know about. Another one uh, uh, maybe is the pretty groundbreaking resolution in 2000 on women, peace, and security, mm. and the role of women um, in peace uh, making, and peace building, and peace keeping. Um, and this field has grown and grown yeah. and grown in the last, you know, 20, 23 years. It's pretty uh, now. It's it's part of the fabric, but but at the time it was pretty uh, groundbreaking, and and I think very very important for the whole sort of uh, field of diplomacy. And there's now a UN. Uh, UN Women Office and other other aspects of this um, that have grown and grown and have become an in integral part of, of diplomacy, and I think is is pretty, you know, is it is pretty important. And and that wouldn't get the uh, uh, attention that I don't know some Security Council right. uh, resolution that stopped a war uh, might. But these kinds of things uh, on the thematic side have been growing. Counterterrorism. There's now a pretty solid collection. Of, of anti-terrorism conventions th that are used, even though we still haven't been able to agree on a definition for uh, terrorism, there is still a body of work um, that countries will ascribe to uh, in in going after uh, terrorism and trying to defeat it. And so in, in lots of these different areas, I think we've seen some incredible uh, progress that, that should be highlighted. All right, well, Jeff, Tressa. I thank you very much. I think it's been a great uh, wrap up to our very interesting season. So thanks, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Great. All right. There you have it, folks. Thanks again to Jeff and Tressa for joining us to wrap up our fifth season. I can't believe it's been five seasons already. And thank you to you, our listeners, for continuing to support the podcast and explore these fascinating topics with us. We'll be taking a break for the rest of the summer, and we might have a few bonus episodes here and there. But stay tuned wherever you get your podcasts for our sixth season coming out in the fall. Until we meet again. This episode was produced by Daniel Henderson. Thank you to the Carnegie Corporation of New York for their support for this podcast. Be sure to check out any episodes you may have missed via our website. Please rate, review, and follow this podcast wherever you listen, and tell your friends and colleagues to come find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or anywhere else they listen. Follow us on Twitter, at GU Diplomacy, and visit our website, isd.georgetown.edu, to learn more about our work.